You know, I've only been on my newly successful YouTube channel for a few weeks now, but it's already started to change my life for the weirder. I'm a pretty boring guy, I don't expect nothing through the post. I'm not busy like that, I never get anything in the mail. But uh, just, you know, just today I'm expecting a whole bunch of cables, I mean that's nothing interesting, uh, a studio light, which has actually already come and it's staring me right in my face, uh, and a shipment of over 1,100 tampons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, uh, you know, that's a story for another day. Because today we're talking about the fact that I've just watched one of, if not the lowest rated action movie of all time, Attack Force. <coughs> the title makes it sound better than it is. Ah uh, yes, some of you will have already heard of this infamous installment of Seagal, and if you know Steven Seagal, you know he's known for nothing but the highest quality movies. Cue the epic anime training montage. One doesn't simply watch a Steven Seagal film. One must first open the mind, prepare the body and soul. You must be a river, a tree, a mountain, unmovable, unrelenting. Like a tectonic plate you bend only to mother nature. And then, and only then, are you ready to consume Seagal. I'm ready. So, I watched Attack Force, and you know what? It actually wasn't that bad. Psych a lot! No, it, no, it was, it was terrible. It, 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 it was one of the, it's possibly the worst film I've ever seen. <laughs> Easily the worst thing I've seen all week. And bear in mind, I have just watched episode six of Rings of Power, so that's saying something. I would rather read the Old Testament upside down, written in Vietnamese, while two hairy Dutch women take it in turns to methodically punch each one of my testes until they resemble Cassandra from Doctor Who before I watch this film again. And straight off the rip, the title sequence is... <laughs> It's absolutely abysmal. It's just a bunch of blurry b-roll, try saying that ten times fast. But the thing is, they went a bit too ham with the Gaussian blur, and rather than leaving like a bit of air of mystery, a bit of like, ooh, what's going on here? It's it. You can't see a goddamn thing, and it just looks like soup. I can't even attempt to infer what is going on here. This is the title sequence you get if you kick your grandmother directly in her face and then ask her to make a title sequence on PowerPoint. This is what you end up with. And before you ask, yes, yeah, yeah, it does go on for way too long. Almost two minutes of this. Oh my, like two minutes of normal footage, fine. Try watching two minutes of just completely blurred footage. It's, it, it's nothing short of unwatchable. And then finally, the movie begins and we get a break from this god awful blurry footage and we're then greeted with some silky smooth Four frames a second footage. We have confirmed movement. There is no reason for the frame rate to be this low. I have watched the entire film. At no other point did they use like a low frame rate for like some sort of artistic effect. For whatever reason, the very opening shot, the establishing shot, is in 12 goddamn frames a second. They filmed it in 24 frames a second, and then they've attempted to put it in slow-mo. But anyone knows, if you're running a film at 24 frames a second, you play that back at 12 frames a second, it's gonna look jaggedy as hell. You end up with this. This is the very opening scene. <laughs> and my god, if this isn't a sign of things to come. So the film starts with some sort of ambush at, uh, what, what was it called? The Majestic Research Facility. That sounds pretty scary. The Majestic Research Facility. Oh, is that the one just around the corner from the Glamorous Lab and just down the road from the Yas Queen headquarters? I, I, I think I know the one. At least I think this is an ambush. The opening scene is, it, it's very dark. And, and again, not even like in a, like an artistic kind of way. It, it, it's just, it's, it's straight up hard to see anything really. So it, it's kind of up to your interpretation. I mean, I call it an ambush, but really, this is a unit of fully armed people who have clearly been hired to protect something. This is this group being surprised by four blokes walking round the corner. Surprise! Code one, code one, we have gunfire on the ground. Now, when you're assigned to protect something, typically, you will be looking out for anything that might threaten the safety of said thing. You don't sit there staring at the thing. That leaves you vulnerable to attack by pretty much everything. And these guys didn't like silently paraglide in or anything like that. They just walked straight up to them. Bang, bang, bang. And oh my God, these shots are so dark. It like, right, I'm gonna play you a quick clip. You try and tell me what's going on because God knows I don't know. I don't have 
have the slightest idea what is going on right now. The who I believe to be the antagonist, but could also be the protagonist, have now spawned in uh, getaway motorbikes. <laughs> I do appreciate that these guys who have, like, they, they walked up to a fully armed escort, all strapped up with ARs, without question, didn't hesitate for a second, but when an attack helicopter comes, they take their time just putting their helmets on before they ride away. <laughs> Okay, so two of them did immediately get shot, but they were wearing helmets, so they died safely. This is important information, children. Remember, always wear a helmet, even if you're being chased by an Apache. <laughs> I like how the night vision is just as useless as the rest of the cameras. It doesn't matter if it's green, you still can't see anything. Now, I'm sure you're well aware that Steven Seagal is a force of nature, a force to be reckoned with indeed, but at this point, I'm not sure whether he's trying to prove that he's such a badass that he can take people down with minimal movement or effort. Or whether he's so large now that his mobility is reduced to that of a dead elephant. I mean, I know this was made in 2006, but by God, his lightning fast reflexes are put on full display. Just watch how quickly he pulls the trigger when he notices danger. He's like a coked up ninja, he's so damn fast. I'm 26 and I'm already bald and I can still make fun of this goober's scalp. I mean, I know some weaves are made of like horse hair, but this guy looks like he's just straight up flex taped Black Beauty's tail to his dome piece. <laughs> Seriously, it needs to go easy on the hair dye. We we have gone past jet black. We're at like we're at like satin five black. Fifteen thousand miles per hour hair look at us. It looks like a road that hasn't set yet. So the dialogue is as good as you'd imagine. So yeah, it's it's a complete disaster. We're talking like rings of power level right in here. So Steve is now in a heated conversation with whoever he works with, saying, I'm not gonna clean up after these people anymore. And then they tell him to just leave it, man. But isn't that, isn't that what he just said? I mean, what's going on here? The consequences are the same, no matter how you look at it. I mean, we made the treaties, they broke them, and now you sit back and expect me to clean up after them? That's not going to happen, you hear? Marshal, I repeat, let it go. I don't know. We received new orders, sir. 0800 hours to Paris. A training mission. Oh, well, let's go pack our gear. <laughs> I promise, okay, I promise I have not edited that at all. It is just overdubbed that badly. Oh, well, let's go pack our gear. It's not even like they're overdubbing in a different language. They're overdubbing in the same language it was recorded in, and it's still this bad. And if you don't know, Steve, good old Steve, he's, he's, he's not quite as flexible as he used to be back in the 80s. So these days, he's more famous for always sitting down in every scene that he's in, and getting a stunt double to do pretty much everything for him. And when I say pretty much everything, he's even had stunt doubles walk up and down stairs for him. Steven Seagal, more like Steven Seagal, eating everyone's food at the beach like it has. Okay, okay, that was a low blow. That, that was mean. That was cruel, but it is true. At this point, he's just like a make-a-wish kid. It's like, yeah, oh, come on, Steve, you can come to the set, but stay in your chair, will you? Oh, Europe! Is that where France is? Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I do regularly forget where France is, you know, being such a small, niche country. And Edward Morgan recommended him as replacements. No, 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 no. Please tell me this entire film isn't going to be badly overdubbed. He, he's so goddamn late. He's definitely one of these, I only do one take actors. And that one take that he does, he completely messes up. And the guys working in post on this film have had to try and polish a Steven Seagal sized turd. And not to mention the fact that the... Someone's knocking on the door, hold up. Oh! Oh, you thought I was joking about the tampons, eh? You thought I was joking. 1,154 tampons. You get a tampon. You get a tampon. You get a tampon. Men don't joke about menstruation. Okay. Children, let's go. Wait, what children is he talking about? Is he talking about that group of grown-ass adults? Is this like, is he trying to belittle them? 
Is it? Is this like a power thing? Is this like a? Is, is it a term of endearment? Well, I mean, I suppose he is. I suppose he's about 137 years old at this point, so uh, in comparison, most people are children. Okay, now prepare yourselves for what is possibly some of the greatest camera work I've ever seen. So, <laughs> the camera goes to follow him one more time. So, and they just left that in. This is. Oh, this is comedy gold. This, there's, this has to be a parody. Just look how unstable this footage is. Marshall Lawson. What do you guys know about him? I mean, the man walks with an air of confidence. It's it looks like the cameraman ran out of breath while sniping on Call of Duty. Requesting permission to leave the premises. Can't get no love around here. Yeah, we were uh, thinking of going to a titty bar. I ain't getting no love and I'm too old for love. What? I ain't getting no love and I'm too old for love. One more time? I'm no love and I'm too old for love. Nope, I got nothing. Is he saying he's too old to find love in a strip club? Because if so, I, you know, I, I don't think that's an age thing. I, I just, I, I just don't think that's what strip clubs are for. Why don't your children go on? We'll catch you later. Is this a power thing or is it a fetish? Like, wh why does he keep calling these people children? Anyway, the children then manage to find themselves a strip club to go to. And the bouncer looks really familiar, but I just, I just can't think why. This has to be intentional, right? There's, there's, maybe it was 2006, but there's no way they hired a guy that just happened to, to look just like Steven Seagal. Steve definitely went to the directors and was like, oh, you need a you need like an alpha bouncer looking guy. Um, yeah, oh, you definitely need to give him like a, a long jet black ponytail. And the director's like, uh, why is that Steve? Oh, it'll just help sell his masculinity more. It's definitely, it's definitely something you should, Steve. You're doing that thing again. You're trying to self-insert into every alpha character. You, not everyone can look like you, Steve. The, bla the black ponytail isn't cool. Never has been. I feel like Steven Seagal is, I feel like he's Donald Trump from an alternative timeline that just happened to get lost in this one. Th that's the best way I can put it. This is the best day of my life! Yeah! yeah! Woo! Best night ever, man. I've never seen a fully dressed female before. That's pretty sick, bro. Men are not like this, I, s I swear. So the three guys went out to the strip club and as soon as one of them pulls one girl, that's it, he calls time and they all have to go home. I mean, you know, they've pulled one girl between three of them. I mean, sharing is caring, I guess. Thank you very much, you've been so very kind. Right? Yeah, now, I've never been to a strip club myself, but I can almost guarantee that's not how they work. You can't just walk in and apprehend the staff. like. How did they manage to pull off this feat? I hear you ask. Why? Smooth talking, the owner, of course. Can I talk to you for a minute, man? What's your pleasure? That girl. Treat her right. Did you? <laughs> okay. Go. Nope. I'll send someone round to collect. Well, that was a pretty autistic conversation. And then just when you think can't get any worse, good old Stevie Wonder's found himself some prey. You alright by yourself? Mm -hmm. Alright. Yeah, she definitely seems like the kind of girl who's into a big bronze bloated pensioner, so uh, yeah, best of luck with that one, mate. Okay, Steve definitely wrote this script. And then the children are murdered in what is possibly one of the most socially unhinged pieces of cinema I've ever seen, but good news because Detective Siegel's on the scene. See you later. Hey. My, what sharp senses you have. So Steve then proceeds to kick open the door and it turns out one of his colleagues is dead against it. And, uh, you know, usually people would, you know, maybe they'd scream or they'd at least show some signs of shock. See, Steve's pretty, he's unfazed by all of this. He notices his dead colleague and rather than move the body respectfully, he just tries to like swat him away <laughs> with the door. Whoever wrote this script was definitely lobotomized before writing it. No question. Now some of you might be thinking, ah, but yeah, but if they've been working in this line of work for a long time, maybe they, you know, they're probably unfazed, but uh, you know, at this point, they probably become numb to the idea of death. What's so special about this guy? They've literally just walked past the other two dead colleagues, 
not bothered at all, yeeted one of them out of the way with the door. They see this guy, they're like, oh my god, oh my god, what happened? But, you know, as always, Columbo's on the scene and he knows exactly what's going on. No, don't bother. They're all dead. Oh, you don't say. Thanks, Steve. I'm Commander Lawson and this is uh, Chief Dixon. And uh, we're all active military. Wait, they're all military? So, this is a military operation? These are my guys. Oh, they're your guys, are they, Steve? Oh, you know, it's, it's a good job you took such good care of them. Though. Imagine this plate of meatballs as your boss. Oh, that's a bruh from me, dog. Bring the bodies and take them in for a special autopsy. The bodies are mine. They are under my jurisdiction. Okay, listen to me, young man. I'm gonna have somebody very high up in your government call you immediately and explain to you who has jurisdiction over these guys. Do you hear me? I don't have a comeback right now, but at some unspecified time, I'm gonna have an unspecified worker tell you some unspecified information. So uh, what you gotta say about that, hey, wise guy? And then the other guy, and I'm calling him the other guy because I literally have no idea what anyone's name is. I don't think anyone's been mentioned by name yet. So God knows what anyone's called. Unspecified protagonist number two goes to the strip club that the children went to earlier in the film and uh, he, you know he's looking for a bit of information and he finds out uh, that the girl's name who was responsible for the death of all the children they find out her name is Weena What's your name? Weena Maybe you can help me with something Weena Ah yes the famous French name Weena Ah oui 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 je m'appelle Weena j'ai une grosse baguette oui 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 My team are well trained Real well trained. Professionals were they? Well, I mean, I mean, they're already dead. And on their very, the very first night of active duty, they decided to get pissed and go to a strip club. Professionals. And I do want to quickly touch on some of the artistic decisions they've made with the, uh, the cinematography. And when I say artistic decisions, I mean every other scene is out of focus. We developed it together. Robinson and Werner kept the whole operation very hush hush. So, unspecified protagonist number two is currently interrogating as yet unnamed villain number one. I'm doing you a favor. If you were to arrive there, she'd kill you instantly. You think the US Army is just gonna walk away from this? Now, I know we've already established that they're all military, but like, does not one of these people have, I don't know, a weapon? These have to be the least armed people I've seen since Tiger Man. <laughs> Oh, you're going to regret that, soldier boy. Oh, no way! That soldier boy! He looks different than I remember. I don't think so, guinea pig. Oh, and he's called guinea pig? Huh, wow, these, these characters have some weird ass names. So far we've met Wiener, soldier boy, and now guinea pig. You got it all wrong, Arun. <laughs> Revenge is a two-way street. Wait, so he's just injected him and then left? Like, he was using the threat of the injection as leverage to get the guy to talk. He got all the information he wanted and then injected him anyway. Why just randomly commit a crime at the end of an interrogation? This makes sense. This makes sense. Probably. Ah, I see the cameraman's as drunk as ever. We're being followed. <laughs> it just keeps going. I'm about to find out. Can someone please explain to me what just happened? Did he get stabbed or did a wall just explode? Like, why? Why do I care? Okay, so far I think we've only seen one scene where Steve is not sitting down and the, the dialogue, the like the delivery of the dialogue is he, he just sounds like a man on his deathbed. You know like, you know in films when like, a character's about to die and they say one last thing and they're like, <laughs> that's what he sounds like all the time. He might not be happy about our personal thing, but he knows who sent me here. I'm coming up to about a third of the way through the film and I still have no idea what is going on. Not even, not a clue what is happening. You know the you know the whole never let them know your, your next move meme? That is this movie's unintentional MO. Wait, that's it. Go back. That door handle is the very essence of this film. Whoever installed that door handle also wrote this film. It's like it's it, it's doing the job it's supposed to, but just not in a very good way. 
thanks for the decent intel. You're welcome, soldier. Okay, for real, this guy and Steve are military, like what military designation do these guys have exactly? Colonel Mustard? That, that was another fat joke, Johnny, and not a very good one. Now, we're about halfway through this dumpster fire, so if you do want to see part two, make sure you stick around. If you like and subscribe, I'll give you tampons. It's a good trade. Take them. And as always, a big shout out to the channel members and the patrons who choose to help me behind the scenes. We have the Giga Chads, Steve the Goat, Puzzle One, Saeed, Brennus, Dr. Melski, and MG Virgil. And I do want to say, the YouTube channel members, some of your uh, profile pictures are now randomly shown on my uh, YouTube channel front page. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And I've just added a bunch of custom emotes uh, that only channel members can use. So make sure if you're a channel member, try them out, man. And also we're at the end of the month, so everyone on this list is going to be having their names put on this art piece that I'm having made. Uh, it's going to be, it should be done within a couple of weeks, and then as soon as it's done, I'm going to go stick it on that back wall. And there we go, part one of this video. I do hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you can stick around for part two. But in the meantime, make sure you take care of yourselves, guys, and I'll see you real soon.